This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. Listen to your customers, you know, ha- however you... You can do that, you know, if you've got to engage with your customers and you've got to um, listen to what they're saying and you've you've got to evolve and change, you know. Uh, unfortunately, what, what, what you love isn't always what the people want. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The east coast of Australia is dotted with the most wonderful seaside towns. As our appetite to explore Australia increases, so too has the appetite of professionals to leave the cities and raise the bar for regional dining. And it's creating a regional voice in food like we've never seen before. Scott Price is the owner and chef of Yellowtail Restaurant in Terrigal, New South Wales. Scott, how are you? Good, thanks, Huck. Yourself? I'm good. Terrigal is uh, sort of uh, the escape location for people in Sydney when they want to get away in in summer. What was the drive for you to choose that location for a restaurant? Uh, Look, I I worked for um, many years for a fellow named Gary Skelton up um, on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland where I'm from. Um, And he sort of you know, imparted his wisdom over the years to me about business and hospitality businesses and sort of the need to be not too far from a capital city within an hour is what he always sort of advised, which is sort of what he did. He he went from Sydney and open season in Noosa and um, did really well and then, and then I worked for him at Harvest in Coolum. So... His idea was that, you you know, you couldn't be too far from the capital um, or a capital. So um, I didn't really feel um, that Queensland needed what I had to offer. So I looked further afield and, you know, Terrigal is about an hour, just over an hour from Sydney. So I thought... Um, just jumped in the ute, drove down and had a look and that's what I've come up with. <laughs> well, what, what attracted you to Terrigal once you got there? What, and what was it like, the, the food scene for you? Um, look, Terrigal sort of has its has its fine dining restaurants, has a, has a strong cafe culture. Uh, you know, it has, a, it has its few fine dining restaurants, but I guess... You know, there's they're, they're sort of the kind of fine dining restaurants that you can find anywhere, really. They don't really um, have anything unique about them. Nice enough oceanfront places, but I just I thought Terrigal could use something a little bit different. I thought that there was a clientele for something, I guess, a little bit more modern, a little bit more city, I suppose, would be would be how I describe what we do, you know, just a little bit a little bit more forward thinking, I suppose. And, I mean, we've we've got a tiny space realistically um, and, you know, no sort of ocean front or anything like that. But, you know, we, we sort of make up for it with, you know, interesting food and, and good service and an interesting wine list. So we sort of make up for not having the view and just being in a, in a small side street, um, you know, hole in the wall, really. We sort of make up for it in those other ways. Were there challenges when you first opened up in bringing sort of this sort of elevated experience to the region? Um, not really. I think, um, you know, I think people were ready for it. You know, I think they were crying out for it. Um, it certainly um, took a little while, a little while to organically build a bit of a following. You know, I think we had, um, you know, the people that that were ready for it, the, the real foodies, um, you know, they jumped on board very early. 
but um, you know, to to sort of have a successful business, you you sort of need more than that. Really, you need to kind of um, endear yourself to to a whole broad market, really, to 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 be busy all of the time. So, um, you know, I guess that the second stage took a little bit more time. You know, a little bit bit more time and a little bit more effort into you know, letting people know what we did and what we're about. And um, so, yeah. You mentioned uh, you grew up on the Sunshine Coast. Well, take us back to that time. What sort of role did food play for you in your family? Well, um, growing up, I actually, you know, I come from a farming background um, out in sort of um, off the coast a bit um, out in Darling Downs. So, you know, we've we sort of grew up um, growing grain and stuff like that, um, fairly traditional family, I guess. Um, so, you know, I guess, um, you know, food at home, you know, mum's a great cook, um, you know, but food at home really revolved around what dad wanted to eat, which was usually sort of, you know, well done steak and, and chips and peas and stuff like that. But, you know, we, 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 you know, we had treat meals as well, you know, like most Australian families, spaghetti bolognese and stuff like that was, was always a favorite. Um, you know, m- mum was a great cook, but I think she was sort of a bit limited um, by what dad wanted to eat. <laughs> <laughs> When did you first start start getting interested in food uh, as a potential career? Um, look, um, like a lot of young men, especially in the country, I kind of began to flunk out of school a little bit towards the later years. So university kind of really got taken off the table for me. Um, and I guess around the same time, I, I kind of learnt a bit more about myself and that I was probably, um, you know, more a creative person, I guess, than a, you know, than than an intellectual type sit down and study and, and do exams kind of person. So, um, you know, for me, and because I, I had loved food, um, it was really just a, a natural progression. You know, I really, I, you know, I, I had enjoyed, um, you know, reading cookbooks and and coming up with dishes and having that creative side. So um, really just as I got towards the end of school and things weren't going well on a, on a study level, um, you know, I st- sort of started to look at it as a career. Take us back into the kitchen when you first started in commercial kitchens. Well, do you have any stories from that time? Oh, look, I, you know, I did my apprenticeship in um, at at the the casino on the Gold Coast. Actually, I, I went there as a straight out of school, and um, you know, it's quite overwhelming, I guess, for for a young kid to walk into a place like that. I mean, you talking about a few hundred chefs and a real sort of institution um, the place was at the time, you know, had its whole in-house um, sort of apprenticeship system and, and teachers and, you know, it was, I guess, as my first real workplace, it was pretty overwhelming. But, um, you know, I stuck it out there and, and, and realistically it gave me a great foundation um, because it really, you know, you're talking about maybe 20 kitchens in that place. So you really covered the whole, the whole, um, yeah, the whole gamut of, um, of cookery really. Um, and a lot of it was, was sort of based on, on the old school, you know, kind of hierarchy and, and all of that sort of stuff. And, 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 you know, you had all the traditional sections like garmage and sorciers and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then you had your fine dining restaurants, which, you know, at that time um, they were quite good restaurants. So, yeah, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think it was pivotal um, in my career. I think it gave me a really good foundation. But, you know, um, I, I, I probably, and I'll probably say this to other people, I think you learn just as much in the first few years out of your apprenticeship than you really do in your apprenticeship. You know, once I went sort of further afield and started to take on, you know, bigger roles and stuff like that, um, yeah, I learned a lot. What were some of the key uh, venues and, and moments um, as you built your career? Um, look, I went overseas and, and worked in London as, um, 
most of us or most of us did at that time. Um, you know, I, I ended up working for Sally Clark in London. Um, probably not well known in Australia, but certainly over there, she's kind of the the doyen of um, you know modern modern Mediterranean cooking. And, you know, she's been there for oh, 35, 35 years, I think now. So she's had a restaurant there, and she's got a a little a little chain of sort of gourmet um, delis, I, I suppose you call them cafe cafe shops. Um, yeah, and just I, I guess, I guess when I went there, really, I just relearned everything. You know, I relearned how to do it properly. You know, it was simple food, but the 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 level of precision um, involved in in the prep work and and you know that the cooking of the the fish and the cooking of the meats and and just the cuttings, the cutting precision that they really required there. Just it really, um, it really made me go back and relearn everything I'd I'd learnt. Um, really, really um, learnt how to do things properly. I think having grown up on a on a farm in uh, in Queensland, what, what was it like for you living in London? Um, I liked it. I, I, yeah, I loved it. I, to be honest, I, I, I'm not. I don't think I was a very good country boy. You know, I, I don't think it was. You know, I, I couldn't wait to leave um, Dolby, um, the Darling Downs. To be honest, uh, you know, I wasn't really cut out for, for the place. You know, I, I wanted to see the world, and um, you know, I wanted to. To, to live in the cities and and um, and and see the world, so um, you know it was definitely an eye opener. And it and look, it, it did become a bit much after a certain period of time. I don't think you can, I don't think you can live in London forever. You know, we sort of, um, I sort of ended up moving to Edinburgh after that, um, and ended up starting a, a small fish restaurant, pretty similar to what. I do now um, with uh, with a, a caterer that I was working for. Um, you know, he had a small gallery space about the same size as, as what Yellowtail is now. Um, and so when I'd sort of come with the background of working at Sally Clark's, you know, he, he jumped on that and we we opened that little fish restaurant called Big Fish and, you know, it um, sort of opened to rave reviews and it was just flat out the whole time we were there and, um, you know, again, it was just providing um, providing an experience that, that the people in Edinburgh didn't really have. Again, Edinburgh, you know, you sort of have casual places and then very fine dining places and nothing in between and, I guess my forte really is is small bistro style restaurants and and just with I guess more interesting food or sort of you know using powerful flavors and, and stuff rather than you know boring sort of fine dining food so you know it, it kind of kind of worked the same as what Yellowtail does it was kind of appealing to a market that was there and um, you know it was a great success and you know unfortunately my visa expired and I had to come home. Well, you returned home um, and, and joined uh, Gary Skelton at season. Um, you mentioned he was a bit of a mentor. What, what sort of uh, influence did that time there have on you? Uh, with, with Gary, um, from a food point of view, again, it was just reinforcing those ideas that I, that I already had um, about you know, that a good restaurant doesn't have to be sort of tepid, cold, um, mucked around with food, you know. You could, you know, you could be busy and fast and, and, and fresh and and just, you know, um, and simple and and, and people um, would love that. That's what I learned from him from a food point of view. But I, I think with Gary it was, it was more about um, – you know, just operating a business, you know, and and trying to motivate the people around you. You know, I ended up being his head chef at Harvest, you know, and, and, and you know, Gary was – Gary sort of made a lot of money out of season when he sold there, so he, he didn't really have to work a lot. He did. He still did, you know. He worked three or four days a week, and but he always had a head chef and it was just a, 
uh, just just learning from him about running a small business, running a hospitality business, trying to motivate the people around you, trying to get people to take responsibility for for making it happen. You know, I think I think I learned you know as much about the business side of things um, as I did about food. What's some of the key things um, that you need to focus on when you're running a small business like a restaurant like yours? Um, look, I think you have to accept that it's an ever-changing uh, ever changing thing. You've got to remain on the front foot. You've got to um, solve a lot of problems. You've got to solve a lot of problems without um, getting overwhelmed and forgetting, you know, why you got into it in the first place. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're nearly at six years at Yellowtail and, you know, I wouldn't say it's been smooth sailing the whole time. You know, there's a lot of challenges, um, you know, without even <laughs> discussing the last two years um, with COVID. But, um, you know, there's, there's always challenges. Um, it's just about rolling with the punches, um, taking, taking notice of what people say. You know, just using using reviews to your advantage. We're, we're very fortunate, Yellow Tail, that we really only get good ones. But if we if we do get any that are slightly less than favourable, then you know we we can, I kind of use that with the staff, and we sort of discuss anything openly, and we kind of really utilise them. We don't take them to heart, but like I say, we are very fortunate that they're overwhelmingly positive. Um, but, you know, we, we sort of use that stuff. You know, I mean, Yellowtail's a very – look, from, from the outside, it's a very small restaurant, but, you know, we've got 20 staff. We're very busy seven, seven days a week. Um, you know, it, it looks like a tiny hole in the wall 30-seater, but, um, you know, when you're doing sittings and turning over tables and you've got an outside area – it's it's you know and it, and you're just running over a seven day week um you know it adds up and and we've been pretty fortunate to be busy and um you know i have staff that really take responsibility now obviously when we you know when i started it was really a very small team you know and uh, i was the chef and you know, I kind of had – it was really only two of us, two or three of us in the kitchen, very small kitchen, you know, and that was great. I loved that. You know, I got to basically have my hands on every plate of food that went up so I knew, you know, I knew what was going out was great and if it wasn't then, I, you know, it was my fault. I would I would have to fix it. But, um, you know, that that was a different business back then you know we're a hell of a lot busier and you know i have a head chef and sous chef and a few other chefs and we've got a full front of house team and uh, you know um my role certainly has changed a lot you know it, my role now is is really just about you know the overall picture and and trying to you know just make sure they're all doing the right things and that they're motivated to do the right thing or to to look after the customer, which is really, I guess, what we've always focused on, you know. We, we, without the customer, you, you don't have a business and, and we've always been very customer-focused. Um, so it's just about getting, getting um, you know, getting my guys to, to realise that, you know, if we don't look after them, they're, they're not going to look after us. You mentioned uh, a bit earlier about the the seafood uh, restaurant in the UK, and there's a real seafood focus at Yellowtail as well. What's the interest and in, in, um, drive for the seafood offering? Look, I, I guess um, I guess when I came to town, there there wasn't really one. Um, you know, there wasn't really a strong seafood offering or fish offering. Um, you know the the places around town. You know they they sort of have the tendency to put a bit of farmed barramundi or, or salmon on the menu. And you know we're right on the beach in Terrigal, and we have some great fishermen um, who operate out of out of here and 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 nearby. 
um, I just I thought that was a real shame, to be honest. Um, you know, I mean, pulling pulling a bit of farm barramundi from North Queensland or, or salmon from, you know, Tasmania. I think that's uh, you know that's a bit of a crying shame, really. Um, you know, we've always worked pretty close with our seafood suppliers. You know, we 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 had Tony Wern who you know, buys buys the fish for St Peter. He approached us because he's in Newcastle, um, you know, and he was going down to buy buy all the fish for St Peter every morning anyway and then coming back to Newcastle. So he came and saw us and said that he, he, would, he wanted to buy our fish for us. So, you know, we've had that relationship now for a few years and, you know, Tony's not a guy that just goes and buys any old bit of fish, you know. He knows where it comes from. He knows who the fishermen are, you know. Uh, New South Wales, obviously, it's a, a bit of a system where almost everything goes through Sydney market, whether it whether it's fish, whether it's fished here or not, and then we sort of get it back, <laughs> get it back from them. But, you know, it's a great relationship. We know what's good. Um, you know, we treat it. We treat it a little bit better, you know. We we don't cook cook the crap out of it, you know. And I think um, pe- people appreciate that, you know. You got to have a you got to have a fine touch with with fish. I think um, otherwise, it's a bit of a waste of time. Is, is there a fish of the region um, that you that you love cooking? And is there a way that you love cooking that you can tell us about? Well, look. Obviously, we named the the restaurant um, after Yellowtail Kingfish, um, so you know we we use that when it's good and in season. It's a bit of a tricky fish because if you fish for it any um, any further south, uh, any further north from Sydney, the warmer water um, basically there's a a back a, a, a toxin that. Um, it's created in the fish, so you, it's it's really hard to use. You've got to fish from the the south coast, but yeah, we use look, you know, we use that in season. Um, obviously, a lot of yellowtail kingfish is farmed in Australia, which is a great product as well. But you know, we can we can get the the wild stuff um, in season off off the coast here, so we use that when it's in. You know, we use uh, we use a lot of bass groper from the south coast. You know, and it it costs us a bit of money, but Again, it's you know we, we just like to use those things when they're in season and and they eat really well and it's about a million times better than eating a piece of farm barramundi. <laughs> um, the success of Yellowtail has given you the foundation to um, open another venue, which is on the cards for next year. Is there a bit you can tell us about? Yeah, look, um, yeah, obviously we've 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 done done pretty well in in Terrigal. Um, you know, I, I think um, it's it's just, it's getting busier and busier. There's a lot of new buildings going up, so we sort of got an opportunity to go into a new building, a new build. Um, you know, I mean, Yellowtail's great, and we'll keep keep running Yellowtail. You know, like I say, I've got a lot of staff there, and they take care of take care of it. So, um, but it's it's sort of in a very old building, so. You know, with with the new buildings going up in Terrigal, I jumped on an opportunity to get a, a new, um, new, new shell there. Um, so we'll we'll fit that out during the first six months of next year. And look, we'll we'll, we'll sort of um, focus on the modern Asian kind of thing there, and and probably go a little bit more casual. You know, I think um, really in in Australia those. Sort of good but casual modern Asian places. They they all seem to do very well, and and that is you know those Asian flavors are really what I do best, what I know the most about. Um, and look, over the years, Yellowtail has probably morphed a little bit more Asian than I would have really liked, you know. Um, and that's just mainly because that's sort of the the cuisines that inspire me but you know yellowtail is is sort of fine dining and, and and it'll sort of remain on that kind of eclectic eclectic menu um but yeah we'll, we'll just really hone in on on those sort of southeast asian and, and japanese flavors at at the new one and 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 just and just bring it 
bring it back a notch in in, in price and, and and in in um you know in style so that it's so that it has a fairly broad appeal I suppose um, you know it's sort of family friendly and 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 approachable for for a younger crowd um, you know I think um, Terrigal has had a fairly decent migration of Sydney siders in the last couple of years trying to escape the city. You know, a lot of people can work from home now and they kind of have moved up here and they choose to work from here and, and there's a lot of young professionals in that kind of set. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of time. It's time for for Terrible to have something that's, um, you know, it's still good food, um, you know, certainly a step above any sort of, Thai restaurant or anything around, but you know, just at, just at a very approachable kind of level. Uh, given the circumstances of the last couple of years, international travel is not on the cards for many, but but regional travel really is. What, what do you love about the region that you're in, and and um, what should people expect if they come there? Oh, look, it it's a it's really is an amazing place. You know, we've got. Um, all the Booty National Park, um, great walks, um, amazing coastline, really, really good beaches. The Brisbane Water, um, massive um, area of sort of sheltered water um, for boating and, 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 and um, water sports and stuff like that. Um, ama- some amazing hidden beaches and, and walks and, and great camping and... Um, you know, it really is, um, you know, ge- geographically a- an amazing place just with the, you know, with the national park and and stuff. And, and it really is, um, I mean, it's so close to Sydney. I think, yes, yes, we're regional, but I think we're probably the closest region to Sydney. You know, you, you can jump on the train to Gosford, um, get here in an hour from Central. Uh, you can jump in the car and you can get out here in an hour um, as well, um, as long as you don't hit the traffic. But, um, yeah, look, it's, you know, uh, I, I, I love living here, you know. Uh, I mean, for me, it's it's sort of about that, that Brisbane water. Um, you know, I, I have a boat and I fish myself and I just I can't, um, can't think of, you know, anywhere I'd prefer to be. The last couple of years have been challenging for many, but what's it been like for you in a regional area? Has it has it changed what you do? Um, well, for sure, yeah. I think um, everybody's had to change what they do. Um, you know, the, from a big picture point of view, we've really, I guess, been been a lot busier obviously nobody can go overseas and a lot of people have migrated here and a lot of people are visiting here instead of overseas um <clears throat> yeah look we, we just had to think on if i just had to think on my feet a lot and 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 just roll with the punches um but we stuck with it you know we we sort of kept I kept all my guys employed. Um, a lot of others around the place sort of didn't do that. Um, you know, I kept everybody employed. We 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 did take away the first time around. We did take away the first time around and did pretty well out of it. It just kept us, just really kept everybody, all my all my guys engaged um, with us and kept them kept them with the salary and. Um, <clears throat> kept kept the public engaged really you know we we're pretty strong on social media about our takeaway and what we were doing and you know it's obviously it's not really our forte because it is you know for want of a better description we are a fine dining restaurant so it's not exactly easy to to translate into a takeaway kind of um offering but you know we did it we did that the first time around we did all right and then and then you know once we were allowed to open and we knew we were going to be busy um because everybody's been cooped up for so long then we were kind of ready to go and 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 make the most of it because we kept all the staff so and we did the same thing the second time around you know we we sort of did it a little bit differently we kind of did um you know we just did takeaway on a saturday 
but then we just built it up so that we ended up, I mean, we're a 30-seat restaurant, but we were doing 250 people <laughs> takeaway on a Saturday out of, you know, a five-square-metre kitchen and, we, you know, we had boxes and bags and everything spread through the restaurant. So, you know, we really had to change everything really i mean that's the short answer which we, we we changed everything we we had to pivot pivot very quickly and you know for me it was all just about keeping keeping the staff employed because you know we can't do it without them and we we really wanted to make sure you know i knew it wasn't going to last forever you know and i know maybe it's not over yet but you know i knew it wasn't going to last forever and you have to be ready to to go when you when you're ready to go and I, I didn't want to get rid of any of my guys you know I, 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 I sort of spent a lot a long time working with them and you know they've become a really amazing asset to my business so it was really important to me that we didn't lose them. There's been a lot of uh, professionals and um, moving to regional areas and and opening restaurants do you have any advice on how to make a success of it? Um, listen to your customers, you know, H however you, you can do that, you know, you've got to engage with your customers and you've got to, um, listen to what they're saying and you've, you've got to evolve and change, you know, I mean, a lot of young chefs probably think they know everything, you know, I've certainly been there in the past as well. And, um, unfortunately what, what, what you love isn't always what the people want, you know, so you, you really have to just engage with the public, engage with your locals, engage with your customers and um, and evolve. You know, Yellowtail's evolved a lot over the six years that we've been here, you know, so um, I think it's really important and, um, you know, don't get overwhelmed. There's a lot there's a lot of moving parts to a restaurant and probably a lot more than you sort of see from the outside looking in but you know and a lot of it can be overwhelming you know there's a lot of there's a lot of you know checks that you have to do but um you know it, it sort of um it gets better it gets easier and um you know if you're passionate about what you do um stick with it and and you know you'll you'll get where you want to go. What is it that you love about what you do? Um, look, you know, I'm just I'm a creative person. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I love working in the kitchen. But you know, I'm in my forties now, and it's kind of a young man's game. But um, you know, I, I liked being creative when I was in the kitchen every day. I still want to remain creative um, now. You know, and I think that's a bit of a key for people who are chefs and, you know, there's been a little bit of, um, there's, there's been a little bit of talk out in the industry about whether chefs really get paid as much as, you know, their trades, trades people, you know, friends and, and, and stuff like that. But what I would sort of say is, and I, look, I think it's getting better. you know, I think chefs are fairly well looked after these days. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a creative field, you know, and you get a lot of um, reward from that, I think, if you're, if you're a creative person, you know, and, and obviously fitting out this new venue is kind of, you know, where I'm sort of being creative and, 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 and coming up with a, a new sort of, um, you know, a new idea and, and trying to, to visualise that and get that to come to life. You know, that's kind of uh, how I sort of am creative now. And, look, I still have input in the menu at Yellowtail, but, again, you know, we've, we've got six chefs there now, so they sort of, um, you know, they all have input. And I, I don't think they would want to do it if they if they didn't have to, you know, they don't want to go in every day and cook my food, you know. You know, I think, it, you know, it's it's that's that's part of the, the good part of being a chef is being able to create create the dishes and, and have people love them, you know. So so that's why I do it. You know, that's what I love about my job. It's a creative field. But, you know, it's a creative field that has, I guess, a real, you know, there's an end result to it, you know. Well, Scott, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you today on Deep in the Weeds. Um, 
have a great summer. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Right, I thanks very much, Huck. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.